Kia ora, whara. Uh, I'm a little bit old school as well and, and tend to wander around a bit too, so I'll, I'll have my notes there. Um, yeah, what I want to do today is just to introduce you the idea of a data commons. And I was trying to think, I mean, think of the last couple of days, how to, how to share that story um, because it's quite a complicated piece of work. Um, so I thought what I'd do is just share with you really the motivation behind why we're trying to solve this, this, this big data problem. Um, the other day, uh, Yosef was, uh, asked uh, Lou Sanson a question. He said, how can a bunch of uh, tech entrepreneurs and, and social entrepreneurs help predator-free New Zealand? Uh, what kind of things could we offer? And I've got one answer to that, uh, which I hope to share with you today. Um, predator-free New Zealand is a, is, a, is a data problem, right? It's not just a technology uh, a sort of a bait station problem. It's how you actually mobilise, you know, 4.7 million people across the country, how you coordinate them, how you orientate them, how that system learns, uh, how the scientists can learn what's working, how the communities can collaborate, and how they can share data amongst themselves. And so for the last year, um, I've been talking to a lot of uh, scientists and Next Foundation and, and others about their data challenge. They've all been coming to me saying, help, I've got a data problem and they read this blueprint. Uh, so for example, uh, I've been talking with uh, Devon, you, who you saw the other day uh, from the Next Foundation, and they want to do these little chew cards, right? You know what a chew card is? It's just a, it's a little credit card size thing which you, uh, you sort of go and staple it on a tree or put it on a tree or under your basement and that. It's got a little bit of bait on it. Uh, and then if a rat comes and chews it, you know there's a rat there because you see the card's been chewed, right? Chew card. Um, <laughs> It's, it's really sophisticated technology. Um, but it's part of their strategy, because when you drop 1080 or, or, or have bait stations around the place, or you've got an island which is already predator-free, you've got this 1% problem. You want to get rid of that last rat, call a million dollar rat, you know, because it takes a million dollars to find them. Um, <coughs> um, and um, the problem is, how do you onboard that data in a way which allows an individual, say student, you know, 12 year old, go and manage a chew card and do some citizen science by putting that around their local school or, or wherever they're doing their predator free uh, work uh, and onboard high quality data and then scale that across the country. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that there's about 23 different chew card manufacturers who all got innovative ways of what sort of bait they should use and all that kind of thing. So there's a real scale problem with that kind of data. And then of course, uh, I've been chatting with um, Devin and Andrea Byron, who's the director of the Bioheritage Science Challenge, she'd like to put all of that data, she's got another use for it. That's the operational use, mobilising my community and where's my chew cards and can I go and test them and check them and that. Where's my data, can I see where they're all set so I can remind myself to go back. Um, but researchers and scientists want to study this and understand how to analyse this kind of data. Uh, and Andrea's got this uh, audacious idea, she wants to, for Predator Free New Zealand, she wants to have a weather forecast on, <laughs> on the TV, she wants to know all of the chew card data for, from across the country. We've got 30 million chew cards out there telling us where the rats are. Uh, we want to know what's going on. That's a big data problem. <coughs> That's a scale problem and a, pro and, a, and a quality of data and metadata standards and how can you coordinate amongst those communities. So there's some technology kind of things to solve in that. There's another problem with data. Uh, well, sorry, another opportunity. Data is curious. It's, it's, um, it's, not a, it's a non-rivalrous resource, right? You don't use it up. In fact, when you add two bits of data together, you get uh, more power, okay? Uh, and um, so one plus one equals three. And so some of the other conversations I'm having with, with Andrea Byron from uh, the Bioheritage Science Challenge is she's saying, well, that huge card's data is great. That tells us there's no rats in this area and there's lots of rats over here. But I want to link that data to the water quality data. Uh, and uh, actually, she's got data around eDNA. Have you heard of eDNA? What they're doing is they're taking samples of water and samples of soil, and what they do is they do a little sort of barcode or spectrograph of the genomic content of that soil, because you get 30,000 different microorganisms in a drop of water, right? And in a drop of soil. And it tells you how biodiverse the soil is. So there's an outcome. So if you got rid of the predators, do the snails and the, and the wetters and the worms start to make the soil better, and do you get better eDNA profile? Uh, and then talking with people from Race to the Top, they've got a data problem. They're doing this, they're working with the farmers to, to uh, what do you call it, make fences along the riparian margins to keep the cows out of the water. 
but they want to measure the outcome of that. So the farmers, some of the farmers are really keen to, to do that, but then they want to know the water quality data. So they want to be able to share the data. We want to be able to see, if you call it an ecosystem, right? You want to see the ecosystem. Scientists want to analyze how these things relate to each other. Uh, so there's real value, I call them economies of scope, right? You've got economies of scale. Economy of scope is when you add two things together and get something different. So you know how tall I am, but if someone else knows how much I weigh, that's okay. But if you know how tall I am and how much I weigh, you know that I need to do some exercise. Um, that's an economy of scope. Data is like that. And, the, and so what we want to be able to do is join up the disparate sources of data, integrate data, and then reuse it. Andrea wants to use it for science, whereas this person on the front line, this 12-year-old, wants to just do their chew card, and then they want to see the results. You know. um, so we need to be able to share and reuse and integrate data. <clears throat> There's a problem, though. Um, our current models don't really let us do that very well. And um, my background actually is in um, social development, and I, I spent 10 years in child protection, and I've uh, been working on trying to, trying to disrupt that system because it's not working. But one of the problems I had was data sharing. We need to understand what's going on, but big government's quite coercive and nobody trusts them to have the data. Uh, so I've been chatting with, um, I had a meeting with Anne's jury from Women's, uh, Women's Refuge. And she was saying, I don't want to give my data to that effing uh, MSD be just because they're going to give me a contract. But I do need them to be able to evaluate the service so they give me more money. So how do I form a trust relationship when I share data and not just sort of open the floodgates and then lose all control of it? It's the same for artists. Anna and I have been chatting about this for artists. You publish something on the internet and then it's gone, right? So you want to retain some providence and some special relationship with your data. Um, scientists, uh, the scientists, you know, I want to, I've been sort of measuring how many wet is per square metre and I'd love to know the eDNA kind of in this area and the number of rats in this area but I want to publish first, so I don't want to share my well, wetter data until I know that no one's going to rip it off and, and abuse it. So, predator free New Zealand's a really big data problem, and um, I don't think we'll succeed unless we can do radical sharing of data in a semi-open way, where we can maintain the provenance of the data. Who collected it? Who's adding value here? Yeah, I collected some wetter data and someone else is publishing something on it, but I, I want some credibility for that. I want to know where it's come from. I want to be able to scale it massively, right? There's really hard integrating data when everyone's got a different data standard. Uh, and then I want to develop social license protocols. What are the social license protocols which allow me to share my data with trust and allow me to retain control? And I'm getting all these people coming <laughs> to me saying, oh, can you solve this problem, James? Um, and uh, a lot from the social sector. Uh, and you know, we're talking with um, Plunkett and Midwives want to do a collective impact initiative on the first thousand days. They want to share data with each other. And then Talking Matters want to share data with them because they're still interested in that first thousand days. But then the scientists might want to study it, right? Or the government might want to evaluate it to invest in it. But those people are afraid that SIFs might grab the data and then knock on the door. You know. So how do we manage the social license protocols? So we want free-flowing data, but with high provenance and high trust. How do you do that? One way, the way that's currently being done, is to... Um, uh, well, you can either hold on to it and not share, that's one solution, or you can chuck it on the internet and it's open slather. Um, but people are moving towards the semi-open data. And some of the solutions that are emerging at the moment are these kind of walled gardens like Apple HealthKit or um, Miko or these personal digital vaults or um, in uh, regional councils use LAWA, right? That's the local regional council data on environment and, and uh, weeds and things. Uh, and then you've got Horizon, who's got another data repository on this other stuff. But the problem with these proprietary models, where people are making a data play, really, because they own the data and then they can get users and then they can make a business model out of that, um, is, of course, that fragments the data. So if Samsung owns my blood sugar and Apple owns my heart rate and my GP owns my medical record, because the Ministry of Health wants to keep that monopoly, then uh, you end up with these nice walled gardens, but you don't end up with the ability to integrate and do personalised health. It's the same with the scientists and the, and the people cooperating on the predator free. Um, so that model kind of breaks down. Uh, it doesn't scale well e either. Uh, so we came up with this other solution. I, I, the reason uh, we came up with this was um, I was appointed to this, this working group who was a uh, the public sector people, academics and um, uh, community people got together and, and formed the New Zealand Data Futures Forum. We had a series of public dialogues. And there I started, started to think for the first time about a data sharing ecosystem. Where's 
uh, and I don't mean the bugs, I mean an e a data ecosystem. What kind of system dynamics for data would work to make data free flying but high trust? Uh, and so I, the first thing I said to them was we need to set some principles in place. What would success look like? And one of the, one of the, so, and they adopted the principles, and, they, and the government signed up to those principles. I hope the new government does too. Uh, those principles were data needs to be in the control of the participants of whose data it is. Right? Second one is it needs to be inclusive. We need to not exclude people from data. Right? And by that, I also mean exclude people from the value of their own data. Largely, the data plays at the moment. So Google grabs your data. They extract the value of it for their shareholders and on-sell it. But you don't get to do... That they've got a lovely integrated view of you with your personality profile and everything. You don't get to use that, you know. Um, so it should be for the value of the people whose data it is, uh, and it should be in their control, and it should be high trust. Uh, and the final one was um, trust, control, inclusion, and value. Yeah, I've got them. Um, we did that in 2013, uh, uh, 2012 and 13. Uh, in 2014, I was asked to write a paper on how big data might be able to change the way the social sector works. And I just kept thinking about this problem, and I wrote a paper called Handing Back the Social Commons, where I started to think about data. We need to flip the ownership model around with data. We need to actually change the way we think about data. We don't want to be trading in data, because that sends the wrong system dynamics. And if you're going to be inclusive, high trust, and in control, and high value to people, you need to somehow hand back control. Uh, and I started thinking about this idea of a data commons, I kind of just wrote this up and I thought, you know, that's not my day job and we'll just leave that to one side. But then people like Monaghan's um, and the um, Bioheritage Science Challenge people came along and um, the uh, Next Foundation came along and said, no, 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 we want to take this a step further. <coughs> uh, Matthew introduced me to Robert O'Brien, who's, who's my sort of acting technical architect. I don't know some of you know Robert. Uh, who's busy working on the technical architecture at the moment. Uh, I also introduced me to Billy. Oh, actually, Joshua introduced me to Billy, who I um, recruited to manage a process where we got a bunch of cryptographers, um, blockchain people, um, uh, social sector providers like Children's Matter, uh, scientists from the Predator Free New Zealand, and we spent uh, some time over 2016 developing this blueprint. And I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. Uh, I'm just going to tell you to come and read this because uh, there's not enough time. In fact, there's exactly two minutes. Um, but they kicked the tyres on that idea and really um, gave it some teeth. And in here, we've got a set of principles. I guess all I'd say was, um, you heard of Eleanor Ostrom? Hands up, who's heard of Eleanor Ostrom? Yeah, not, en not, en not enough of you. Um, first woman to get the Nobel Prize in Economics. And I think it took a woman to come up with what she came up with, actually, um, where you've kind of got this, um, the economists are all kind of, um, excuse me, all a few other male economists here. Um, <laughs> you kind of got this model where you think it's either government regulation or it's the free market and that sort of thing. And she's been studying these collective impact communities who have been self-governing for centuries, years and that, and, and doing it successfully. Um, so that is one part of the basis of this. The other part is the sort of stuff Robert's thinking about in terms of identity cryptography and, and the blockchain of the distributed ledger and how do we build governance, uh, sorry, trust and, and transparency and digital credentialization to, at, at scale across true cards, eDNA, water quality, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the other aspect of it is, is community formation. We don't think this is a technology problem. What we're wanting to do, what we are doing, uh, so this is the next book, is getting together, um, so for those two cards, we're getting together a bunch of scientists, two card manufacturers and 12 year olds and, and other people to get together and go, well, what are the data standards? What are the social protocols? You know, what do I need to think about in terms of when I can share this and when I can't share this? And co-designing both the metadata standards but also the social standards for how you might do this. And we want to provide them with the technical architecture and the community architecture and the kind of constitution which allows this to be uh, a very structured way of scaling up their collective impact. Uh, so in the coming year, in 17 seconds, uh, we're just starting. Uh, we're talking with uh, our various sponsors. We've got, um, we're talking next week, actually, with Tyndall Foundation, Next Foundation, Bioheritage Science Challenge, uh, Predator Free New Zealand. We want to kickstart a prototype. 
Uh, we're going to start with a two card. Um, and then uh, scale that out to other kinds of data. Uh, I guess what I need from you and why I'm here is really that uh, it needs this kind of community to help. Uh, I don't have all the answers. What I think is great about New Zealand is we're small enough to start small, but I want to be thinking globally from day one and how to scale from day one. I love those principles, uh, the digital principles, uh, yeah. <laughs> those digital principles you put up there, I was sort of ticking them off, yeah. Uh, except that it's not digital, it's community formation as well, right? Um, and so I need your help, really, to help us do that. And if you're interested, I'm going to leave this. This is kind of one of our, this is our plan to the next foundation. Um, come and get in touch. Um, let's see if we can help. Um, I think um, we can do something here in New Zealand, incubate something which is quite small to start with, which can scale quite quickly if we design it the right kind of way. So thank you very much.